when I was 12 years old, obviously I liked ABBA and Snoopy very much, um, the, the Hezbollah came to my school and it's, it's a generic word we use for those who do God's dirty work, you know, they belong to the party of God. And they came in order to segregate the boys from the girls in the playground, so they were standing there to make sure we don't mix because it was a mixed school and the schools hadn't been Islamicized yet. And of course what we did was just run circles around them. We'd run into the boys' section and the boys would run into ours. But it's just one example of just the obsession of Islamists with controlling the female body and preventing mixing that is deemed to be religiously impermissible. It's funny how they always tell us when we speak about the veil or gender mixing how there are so many more important things in the world, but they spend an awful lot of time trying to control veiling and gender mixing. It's ironic. So even at 12, they viewed girls as sources of fitna or chaos in society. And this applies even to younger children. Uh, this is a great example. This is of a uh, musical ensemble in Iran. It's called the Parisian Ensemble. And they had to go through several photographs before the censors accepted them. This was the first photo uh, of the ensemble which was rejected because the girls are not veiled, though they don't need to be veiled until the age of nine or until they reach puberty. Um, so this is the second photo where, of course, the girls have now been veiled, but it still wasn't acceptable to the censors. They thought the girls' arms were visible and it needed to change. And this is the final photo where the girls have put, been put in the back and their arms and hairs have been covered. So, it applies to younger children and it rots and seeps into everything. Uh, just to give you an example, in 2013, the Iranian regime passed a law in its majlis or Islamic assembly which said that fathers could marry their adopted daughters. And the reason behind this was because they said when the girl reaches uh, her puberty, because she's not really their daughter, there, there could be sexual tension between the, the stepfather and the adopted daughter, and therefore it's best that the father marry her, and then she doesn't need to wear a veil, and there doesn't need to be gender segregation. So it just rots and seeps into everything. The, the veil and the segregation that follows it is, is really central to the Islamist project. And their aim is to completely erase women from the public space and girls. And of course, as Islamists, I mean people who are part of a political far-right movement trying to impose theocracies, Sharia law, similar in fundamentals to the Christian right, the Buddhist right, the Hindu right, and the Jewish right. There's an artist, his name is Philip uh, Toledano, and he's done a series on Iranian censorship of women, calling it Portraits of Absence. And it shows how regular items that are on sale in the shops are uh, where women are on their covers. They're black markers used to completely erase them from the packaging. And you see this on magazines and adverts. Uh, here's another one where the woman's been completely blacked out. And when you look at these photos, I think what it, it tells you is that the chador or the borqa and the niqab are really the fabric version of this black marker, erased, devoid of humanity, disappeared. Uh, I often compare women to the disappeared of Argentina or the disappeared of the uh, 1980s in the Iranian regime where m countless political prisoners were massacred, buried in mass graves, and still you know, no one knows where they are. But this disappeared is based on gender, not political opinion and belief. And despite all the rules that they've imposed, it's never still enough for them. Every day, the fatwa factories across the world issue more rules and more restrictions for women and girls. Uh, we have a TV po program called Bread and Roses. It's uh, beamed into Iran using illegal satellite dishes. And the Iranian regime has labeled us immoral and corrupt, so it's definitely something you should be watching. <laughs> um, and in this uh, program, we have a segment called Insane Fatwa, and we have found a correlation between, uh, you know, the, the most stupidest fatwa, 
versus the imam with the longest and most stupidest name. And there's definitely some scientific research that needs to be done into this. But I'm, I'm going to stand by it despite the fact that there hasn't been evidence. So, you know, the, these rules, don't bring attention to yourself. Don't wear perfume. Don't walk in the middle of the road. Don't uh, wear jeans. Don't show your ankles or your hair. Don't cycle. Don't drive. Don't laugh out loud. Don't sing. Don't slap your thighs. We do a lot of sli uh, thigh slapping on bread and roses just to annoy them. <laughs> And don't go to football matches because really the only reason you're going there in the first place is to glare at the men's thighs, the footballist thighs. And don't eat cucumbers and bananas. I'll, <laughs> I'll leave that up to your own imagination. <laughs> so, you, you know, it's a well-oiled propaganda machinery that warns you against any transgressions. Here's a couple of uh, billboards in Iran and, and other places, Afghanistan, for example. Now, this is a baby, for goodness sakes, and it says, our children are protected via hijab. And this one says, if uh, no one wants to eat the leftovers of flies, uh, and if you don't want to be that, then you need to be properly veiled. So there's this constant barrage of messages saying you're loose if you're not veiled. And of course, you know, in Iran, they have morality police, as they do in Saudi Arabia and in other places. Um, ISIS has them. I read about ISIS uh, uh, morality police walking around with these sort of metal pinchers that tear at the flesh of women who, whose flesh is visible. Uh, so there's morality police, uh, like in Iran, for example. Uh, just recently, they hired another 7,000 morality police in Tehran alone because they can't control women. And no matter how much they try, exactly. You're not keeping us down. Uh, so, you know, this is a picture of it. I mean, it's constant harassment. People are stopped. They're told their, veil, their hair is showing. There, there are fines involved. There can be up to two months in prison. And, of course, there are vigilantes that throw acid in the faces of women who are not properly veiled and on and on and on. Now, this is a wonderful cartoon from Persepolis. I don't know if you've seen the book and the film uh, of Marjan Satrapi, and here she's, you know, you've got some of the police saying, yes, but when you run, your behind makes movements that are, how do you say, obscene. And she says, well, then don't look at my ass. <laughs> and she says, I yelled so loudly that they didn't even arrest me, you know, scared them off. It reminds me of the story I heard. Uh, I don't know if it was one of our friends or what, but uh, this woman was saying the morality police had stopped them, saying that their, her daughter's... Um, uh, legs were showing, and her daughter was like six years old. So she took her umbrella and started beating the guy and saying, stop looking at my daughter's legs. <laughs> and I guess that's a good offense. The best defense is offense, isn't it? So, um, so it isn't a lot of fuss over a piece of clothing, as we're often told. The veil and segregation that it enforces are merely the most public manifestations of what's considered women's place in society, policed at every turn. There's a wonderful Afghan-American writer, Nushin Arbabzadeh, who I've just become familiar with. Uh, she's done a wonderful piece on this where she says that the discussions around the veil here in the West are so sanitized, whereas the really sinister campaigns, the oppressive nature, are very often completely ignored. Here's a perfect example of it. It says, have you ever seen a, an onion uh, that has a worm in it? No because an onion has seven layers of the chador, but the, but the uh, potato has a very light clothing and is always in danger of being eaten by worms. And then at the end it says, so sisters, be an onion. Be an onion. Wow, fun, profound. And in Iran, as in many places, veiling is imposed on the backs of slogans like death to the unveiled women. And in Iran, one of the, their main slogans it was Yoru Sari Yotu Sari, which means you either wear the veil or you will be beaten. And this is a cartoon where, you know, there are Islamists in Iran saying women who aren't properly veiled should be raped. Now, don't forget the veil is compulsory in Iran. And they're still saying this. And this is a perfect example of others fighting for girls to be brought home 
against Boko Haram in Nigeria, and you know the Iranian government's officials are saying, rape the bad hijabi girls, teach them a lesson. And of course, as you know, every calamity from earthquakes, you all remember boobquake, Jennifer McCright's book, Craig, to rivers running dry are blamed on unveiled or improperly veiled women. And this is a wonderful cartoon from Mana uh, Nayastani. He shows, you know, the officials stealing money, going to Canada, um, throwing, uh, someone throwing acid in a woman's face, police beating someone who's got a banner saying freedom, executions, floggings, but here's a woman's hair and the river runs dry. It's typical, um, the sort of uh, attitude they have towards women. And even if in places where it isn't compulsory, including in the West, there is this immense pressure. You know, so there's this idea, if you're veiled, uh, you go to heaven, otherwise you go straight to hell. I'll see you all there. You know, the, the sort of, uh, you're immoral, you know, you're loose. In Turkey, I don't know if you heard recently about a woman um, who was, um, beaten on the bus for wearing shorts. She's a nurse. And the guy was released. Though Erdogan held so many free thinkers in, in prison, none of them seemed to be able to get released. But this guy got released, and he said he just thought you know, she was wearing improper clothing. Um, in Britain, uh, young women who are hijabis but aren't dressed in the way that the Islamists and the fundamentalists think appropriate are called hojabis. So there's this constant, constant pressure Children are veiled, children for goodness sakes, and no one bats an eyelid. Oh yes, I forget. Hijab is a right and a choice, even if it's when it regards children. Specifically speaking though, choice is a formality when there is little right or choice to remove one's veil or remain unveiled without being vilified. This is a perfect Jesus and Mo cartoon Muhammad says, oh, stop complaining, Jesus. You should feel protected like a precious pearl within an oyster shell. And Jesus is like, I just feel hot. And Muhammad says, the important thing is to show the world that it's a liberating, empowering choice, a symbol of your freedom to express your identity. Then he says, can I take it off now? No. <laughs> and that's the thing, you can never take it off. But I think, most importantly, whose side are you on? Of course, there are women who choose and have a right not to have an abortion in Ireland. But you must side with the women who want one and cannot have one because of the states and the Catholic Church's control over women's bodies. But when it comes to us and the veil, it's the other way around. Many feminists, many liberals, those on the left, and I say that as someone firmly on the left, defend the right to be veiled, but never defend the right to be unveiled and to live to tell the tale. What a betrayal. We're told it's our culture, our religion. Leave us to it. Respect it. Well, I'm sorry. Many of us will not respect the violation of women's rights, no matter how it is packaged and dressed. Culture isn't homogeneous. Culture isn't homogeneous. Neither are communities or societies. Defending the group right to impose veiling and segregation defends the powerful. This sort of identity politics ignores and it negates dissent. It fails to see the social and political struggles and class politics. The result of all this, says Keenan Malek, the British writer, is that solidarity has become increasingly defined not in political terms, as collective actions in pursuit of certain political ideals, but in terms of ethnicity and culture. And that's exactly what the far right does as well. They homogenize culture, entire societies and communities, and immediately say that they're incompatible with Western society, so as to promote, if we're honest, what is fundamentally white politics, white identity politics. When it comes to culture, anyway, whose culture are we talking about? The woman and the man resisting the veil, or the theocrats who are imposing it? There is an immense unveiling movement in Iran, for example, even though it is compulsory and punishable by fines and imprisonment. This is a wonderful photo taken in Iran in front of a poster which says, Sisters, you must obey your Islamic hijab. 
and she's there without a veil. And even men are joining this movement with, with messages saying that it's unfair that women should have to co be covered up and that people should be free to dress as they choose. When you are faced with a state and a movement, the Islamist movement, that aims to erase you, erase you from the public space, your refusal to disappear is an important form of resistance and dissent.